Good afternoon. Our first item today is portfolio questions, and we will begin with uh, Justice and Law Officer's first question from Tom Arthur. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to tackle hate crime. Cabinet Secretary <coughs> Hamza Youssef. Uh, hate crime has hugely damaging effects on victims, their families and communities. We must all play our part to challenge it as part of our ambitious programme of work to tackle hate crime and build community cohesion. We're doing a number of things, including we just launched uh, on the 14th of November a consultation exercise, One Scotland Hate Has No Home Here, uh, to inform the content of modernised hate crime legislation that is fit for the 21st century. Uh, as well as that, on the 26th of September, in partnership with Police Scotland, our hate crime campaign uh, was also launched. This campaign aims to encourage witnesses to report hate crime, sending a very clear message that hatred and prejudice will not be tolerated uh, in Scotland. In terms of our consultation, I should say it is open to, to all individuals, communities and organisations. It will help to inform future legislation to address identified needs uh, and, and afford sufficient protection for those who need it. I hope everyone with an interest uh, will participate in the consultation process. Tom Arthur. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and welcome the work that the Scottish Government is undertaking. Um, the day after this Parliament rose for summer recess, my constituent Blair Wilson from Neilston was subject to homophobic abuse and a physical assault. I think that many of us, had we been subject to such an experience, would have perhaps ran, hid, cowered. But not Blair. He took his phone out, he took a selfie, and that image of his bloodied but smiling and defiant face sent a clear message that resonated not just across Scotland, but around the world. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary would join me in paying tribute to Blair and if he agrees with me that it is because of the dignity and compassion and values of people like Blair and countless others that we will together consign hate crime to history in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. I, I could not have uh, articulated it better than Tom Arthur uh, has done. I, of course, add my admiration to Blair uh, and Blair Wilson for, for what, um, how he conducted himself in the aftermath of that terrible, uh, terrible hate crime. Uh, I think uh, a number of other people uh, came out in their support and admiration uh, for Blair uh, as well. Uh, I have been the victim of, of, of hate crime uh, myself. I know how, uh, how difficult it is to deal with. I know how much of an effect it can, and a personal and emotional effect it can have on you. Uh, and nobody would have forgiven, uh, nobody would have faulted uh, Blair whatsoever if he had chosen to just deal with that in a personal way. But instead, he defiantly, uh, as Tom Arthur rightly says, uh, chose to, to, to tell his story uh, and uh, absolutely put out there some of the terrible hatred uh, that, that, that gay people uh, have to deal with in terms of the homophobic abuse that Blair uh, went through. So, yes, I, I want to join with Tom Arthur in, in, in putting on record my admiration for Blair and the countless number of others who stand defiantly in the face of hatred uh, and say that simply there is no home for hatred uh, here in Scotland. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Lord Brackadale's expert review recommended that statutory aggravations should continue to be the core method of prosecuting hate crimes in Scotland rather than standalone offences. So why does the Scottish Government appear to be departing from that? Uh, we don't. Uh, we are going to be consulting on Lord Brackadale's recommendations. We still think statutory aggravators uh, are, are, are the right way uh, to go. I'm not sure from where his question necessarily uh, is stemming from. If it is the question on misogyny, uh, then we will look at that uh, and consult on that, take views on that. It may well be that the views that come back to us suggest that the, the, the issue of, of misogyny, which is deeply ingrained within our society, within our institutions, may be looked at out with the hate crime Framework, that is something that I will wait to see uh, the consultation responses. I'm meeting with uh, Gender uh, and some other organisations uh, who are, are vocal on this issue uh, very shortly. But uh, no, uh, we are very much uh, consulting on the statutory aggravator uh, approach uh, that Lord Brackadale uh, thought was the best approach to tackling hate crime. Uh, but as I say, I'll wait for the consultation responses to come back on misogyny before we take uh, uh, a detailed consideration uh, and, and, and define the best approach to tackle that issue uh, on the way forward. Question number two, Jamie Green. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how many police officers there are. Cabinet Secretary. As of 30th of September 2018, there were 17,147 full-time equivalent police officers in Scotland, an increase of 913 since 2007. Jamie Green. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary? Uh, if we dig deeper into those figures, though, and look at the number of divisional officers, you'll see that they've been cut by nearly 350 since the regional forces merged. And in the last Scottish Crime and Justice Survey, 
It revealed that the number of Scots uh, that are aware of a local pre uh, police patrol has dropped by over 10% since 2012. So given these findings, uh, if the Cabinet Secretary does not think there's been a loss of capacity at the front, uh, does he at least accept that that's the public's perception? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I have to applaud Jamie Green's brass neck uh, for asking uh, this question. The audacity uh, to come to the Chamber and lecture the SNP in police numbers when we've increased the numbers since we've come into power, when we've protected budgets uh, but for, for the police as well. There's been a 5% increase in police officer numbers since 2007. In terms of his party's record, of course, in England and Wales, there's been a 20,000 officer reduction. That's 13%. The majority of that, uh, his party was in control. In fact, if we applied that to Scotland, there would only be 14,000 officers, not 17,147. So if you'll forgive me uh, if I don't choose to take any lectures from him on police officer numbers. In terms of the divisional versus regional versus national split, what I would say is when it comes to national uh, officers in the national structure, uh, of course, it is local communities that benefit from national capabilities, such as human trafficking, such as tackling issues around child protection. That is felt at a local level. So, uh, for example, we'll continue to, to do what we are doing, which has seen a reduction of crime, of course, uh, over the last decade. We'll continue to reward our officers with a 6.5% increase. We'll continue to make sure that they're well resourced and we'll continue to make sure, uh, of course, that we have a, a capable uh, police service. Uh, but uh, what I would say to Jamie Green is that uh, next time he comes questioning and lecturing me to this chamber about police numbers, he may well want to look at what his party is doing south of the border. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary clearly shares my astonishment at the sheer cheek of Tories who blindly support a UK government that's cut police officer numbers in England and Wales by a whopping 21,330, yet criticise this government for increasing, increasing police numbers by 913. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that if the Tories really cared about policing, they would demand that the UK government return to Police Scotland the £125 million in VAT payments that they owe us? Yes, uh, absolutely. Of course, uh, I would associate myself with that. And of course, the backdated VAT for the fire service would be a nice uh, additional compliment uh, as well. And it's not just me that thinks that the Tories are, are completely decimating policing uh, south of the border. It was the Home Affairs Select Committee that said that the Home Office run by Jamie Green's uh, party shows a complete failure of leadership on policing. That was, that of, of course, report was signed by two Scottish Tory MPs as well. So uh, we will continue to do the good work that we are doing in policing, the good work that has seen uh, record low levels uh, of crime here in Scotland. And I will continue to let uh, Jamie Green carp uh, from the sidelines. Okay, can I urge uh, short questions and short answers, please? Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Question, uh, to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with Police Scotland regarding the reform of vetting procedures for recruitment to the Police Service. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, vetting procedures are an operational matter for Police Scotland within the overall legal framework provided by the Parliament. Scottish Government officials regularly meet with Police Scotland to discuss a range of issues. These meetings do, on occasion, cover the operation of vetting procedures for recruitment to Police Scotland. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Jamie Duff is my constituent. He is 23 years old. On two occasions now, he has applied to join uh, Police Scotland, both as a police officer and as a special constable. He has been rejected both times at vetting phase for third party association. Jamie's father has a criminal record, but Jamie became estranged from his father, aged one. Uh, this is not a restriction which applies in other parts of the United Kingdom. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that people like Jamie should not be impeded in their life choices through the sins of their parents. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Alice Cole Hamilton, I hope, will, will forgive me if I don't go into the details of a specific case of which I don't have uh, detail of, and I'm more than happy for him to share those details uh, with me and to, to, to have a conversation uh, with Police Scotland. But in the same vein, I'm sure Alice Cole Hamilton will completely understand that as a government minister, I wouldn't look to interfere uh, in the vetting uh, process on individual cases. It would simply not be right that a government minister have the power to decide uh, who is recruited to the police uh, or not. Uh, in terms of the, the, the issue around checks and, and third party uh, vetting uh, as well, checks are undertaken uh, as, as Alex Cole Hamilton says, not only in the applicant, but also third parties linked to the applicant. Uh, these include family members and or associates uh, where there is information that these third parties have convictions or engaged in criminal activity. The police considers carefully what the relationship is likely, uh, whether the, the, this relationship is likely to, for example, compromise the applicant, compromise the operations of Police Scotland, 
uh, or indeed compromise the reputation uh, of uh, Police Scotland. Uh, uh, Police Scotland will always, uh, of course, uh, work within a legal framework. Uh, if their risk is considered too great, then an applicant can be refused uh, for vetting uh, clearance. What I will also say, and the final point I'll make to Alex Cole Hamilton, and this is not specific at all to, to, to the case, I'm just talking in the general and, and hypothetical, of course, from my uh, conversations uh, with the stakeholders in, in the criminal justice system and, and others, uh, there is clearly a uh, concern about inf infiltration of serious organised crime uh, groups uh, tr attempting to infiltrate uh, into the police. So there is an understanding of why these important vetting procedures would have to be put into place. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the issue of vetting goes to the heart of the integrity of our police officers, which is why the issues raised by Kate Frame at the Justice Committee last week are so serious, those of inappropriate categorisation of complaints and uh, the, the issues in terms of the process of justice. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if he uh, uh, knows whether or not charges have been brought against any of the officers that were implicated in those cases? Uh, I'm not sure this is directly related to, to debating, but uh, I did speak to Kate Frame after the Justice Committee appearance uh, that I had to the Commission. I don't know the specifics of uh, where those cases uh, absolutely are, but we had a very good conversation. Uh, what I would say to the, the member is there's a, been a very detailed consideration by the Justice Committee uh, of the, the issue around complaints. He, of course, has been a part of that. I await the Justice Committee's report and recommendations. I also await uh, Ange uh, Dame Alicia Angelini's interim uh, findings uh, on, on the review that she is carrying out onto this issue and then of course the government will take a very very open mind about how we can improve uh, that complaints procedure going forward. Maurice Corrie. <coughs> Thank you, President Officer. What plans does the Cabinet Secretary have to encourage Police Scotland to recruit more armed forces veterans in, into either a full-time capacity post or as special constables? Secretary. I will raise that uh, with, the, with, the police, with, with Police Scotland, but uh, again, similar to my answer to, to a previous question from Alex Cole Hamilton, this will be an operational matter uh, for Police Scotland. Uh, my conversations with the Chief Constable just uh, yesterday, in fact, we had a very good conversation around how we want to increase the diversity of the police force. We want to ensure that there uh, is a mix of, 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 of people from the, making up uh, reflective of our society and wider society uh, within the police force. Uh, and certainly, uh, if Maurice Corey wants to write directly to the Chief Constable uh, about uh, a very important issue, then he can do that equally if he wishes me to raise it in my next conversation uh, with the Chief Constable, then I'm more than happy to do so. Question four, Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what progress is being made in establishing forensic examination facilities in Orkney for victims of rape or sexual assault? NHS Orkney is in the process of establishing a trauma-informed, person-centred forensic medical examination uh, and healthcare service for adult victims of rape and sexual assault. The local pathways of care uh, have been developed in collaboration with multi-agency partners, including Orkney Rape Crisis. The Scottish Government has committed £2.25 million in the current financial year to help embed the published Healthcare Improvement Scotland standards and to ensure a consistency and approach to the delivery of these services across the country. Liam MacArthur. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response and um, echo the, uh, the, the support of the, of the work done by Rape Crisis at Orkney and also NHS Orkney, but I would also pay tribute to his uh, predecessor, Michael Matheson, uh, who was uh, incredibly supportive of these efforts. I understand from NHS Orkney there are now two doctors uh, who are now trained uh, under the service uh, and that uh, uh, under an advert that went out recently 20 more expressions of interest uh, were, uh, were forthcoming. Unfortunately the training required um, to, uh, to take up these posts um, is, uh, involves travel off island which uh, is a cost both in terms of the travel and the accommodation. Could you encourage um, colleagues in NHS uh, Education Scotland to help support the delivery of the uh, training in Orkney so that we can maximise the resource and the capability uh, domestically in Orkney? Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I, can I thank Liam uh, MacArthur for the question? Uh, I know he's obviously uh, had an interest in this issue uh, for, for, for a while, and I can also thank him for the work and recognition of the work that my predecessor uh, did as well. Can I also put on record, I think, the excellent work being done by the task force led by the, the Chief Medical Officer, uh, Catherine Calderwood, uh, Dr Catherine uh, Calderwood, uh, and the good work being done uh, by, by, by other stakeholders and partners. Uh, in terms of the issues uh, that he raises, uh, I will promise to go back and reflect on those and come back to him uh, with, with uh, some, some update because it may be that, of course, the training uh, may be, be able to be done uh, on, on, on Orkney. It may not be able to be done, and therefore perhaps we should look at the travel costs involved and whether we're able to, to, to come to some sort of arrangement 
uh, or some sort of agreement on that. I'd be very open-minded uh, to that. So if he allows me the time, I'll go back, reflect on uh, what he has to say and see if I can come up with a, a solution that satisfies everybody. Rudy Grant. Thank you, presiding officer. Can I ask about services for children who have suffered abuse? I understand there are moves being made to protect adults, but not children, and they still need to go off island. Can you look at that as well to make sure children shouldn't travel in those circumstances? Cabinet Secretary. I will, and let me also put, put on, on record uh, the, the, uh, the members' own efforts uh, on this. I know she, she had written to my predecessor and had a conversation with my predecessor uh, on this, a hugely important uh, issue. Uh, of course, uh, where that can be avoided, it absolutely should be, but we know, of course, the, the, the specialist training equipment uh, and indeed, uh, because of the, 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 the sensitive sensitivities around children, that might not always be able to be the case, but where it, where it, where it can be, then we should absolutely look at that. So uh, I'm promised to, to, to write to, to Rhoda Grant to give an update on where we are in relation to, to children who have been uh, victims uh, of rape. But uh, certainly the sensitivities involved in this, I think uh, all of us understand around the chamber and we're working to, to a better solution for our children, uh, whether they're on islands or indeed uh, on our mainland. Question number five, Pauline McNeill. To ask the Scottish Government what information sheriffs are given regarding the availability of secure unit places when disposing of a case involving a young offender. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, it's a matter for the judge acting independently to decide what information uh, is required when disposing of a case. In remand cases, the local authority should request that the young person be remanded to their care. Uh, it is the local authority's responsibility to approach each secure unit to establish whether secure care is available as an option. If the young person is likely to receive a custodial sentence at a solemn proceeding, it is the Scottish Minister's responsibility to identify in advance of court an appropriate placement. Pauline McNeill. Last week I raised the question of the case of William Lindsay who took his own life while in Pullman Prison on remand. Um, but I want to be clear about what the Cabinet Secretary is saying. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that the availability of secure places should not be a consideration for the sheriff who's trying to make a decision about the appropriate disposal. And can he answer the question about the reduction in secure places? That must surely be a cause for concern. And I fully understand that there is an investigation ongoing in relation to deaths at Pullman Prison, but surely while this investigation has taken place, the Minister should, Cabinet Secretary should satisfy himself that there are adequate alternatives to prison where that is appropriate in those cases. Cabinet Secretary. I think they're all very important points that have been raised uh, by Pauline McNeill. Can I once again put on record my sympathy uh, to the family of William uh, Lindsay? And I know uh, Pauline McNeill has written to me to request uh, a meeting, and, and, and of course I'll, I'll be happy to, to, to do that and keep other members updated. Uh, just to, to reiterate what I said, it would be for the local authority, and it would be the local authority's responsibility uh, in order to, to find out whether or not there is secure. Uh, accommodation uh, available. Uh, in terms of the relations around uh, the, the, the issues around the availability of secure units, uh, she's absolutely right. Uh, there have been issues uh, over the last few years around the capacity or the lack thereof of capacity available in secure units. It is something that uh, myself and the Deputy First Minister are looking at uh, extremely uh, closely. Um, some of that has been because of the cross-border cases. In fact, a lot of that, a lot of the cases that come to us are cross-border cases. Uh, and there is some uh, sensitivities around um, making sure that they, there is a certain level of occupancy within secure units so that they can maintain and sustain uh, themselves also. But that should not be at the cost of not having a space available should it be required. So these are the issues that the Deputy First Minister and I are looking at. I should be able to say more uh, in, in the coming days, actually, on some of what we're looking to do uh, in relation to this. In terms of the actual individual circumstances, I just say once again uh, that there will be, of course, fatal accident inquiries, mandatory fatal accident inquiries uh, in into the case of William Lindsay and indeed the other case uh, mentioned in around Paul and Katie Allen's case. But as the First Minister said at FMQs last week, we will not wait uh, for those FAIs to make changes where we can uh, and to effect change in a positive manner. But I'll make sure Paul McNeill is kept up to date on that. Question number six, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Can I apologise for coming into the Chamber a few moments late for the start of question time? And can I ask the Scottish Government whether it expects to legislate on hate crime during the current parliamentary session following the end of the consultation process in 2019? 
Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, our intention is to legislate on hate crime during the current parliamentary period. However, before doing so, it's essential that we've heard the voices uh, of communities so that we're sure that the legislation we will be bringing forward is relevant, appropriate, fit for the 21st century. Uh, balancing new legislation with rights to free speech and civil liberties is also essential. We need to carefully look at the outcomes of our consultation, which is open to all uh, individuals, communities and organisations, so that our legislation addresses uh, identified needs and affords sufficient protection uh, for those that need it. I hope everyone with an interest will participate in the consultation process. Patrick Harvey. Thank you, and I certainly agree that we should all encourage everyone to participate in the consultation and recognise the importance of that process. But this will be uh, pretty much a decade after the, the arguments were first made for a, a comprehensive approach to hate crime instead of the piecemeal approach that we'd seen before then. So I, I think the, the, the commitment to legislation during the session uh, is welcome. Can I ask about one of Lord Brackadale's recommendations? Uh, he concluded that specific measures in relation to anti-immigrant sentiment would not be needed because that was already uh, covered uh, by uh, racial grounds. Uh, does the Scottish Government yet have a, a view on that? Because we've clearly seen an uptick in anti-immigrant and other far-right sentiment, and it does seem to me that a case can still be made for some specific measures uh, in relation to those matters uh, to be dealt with uh, as a distinct strand of hate crime. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I'm not the only one in this chamber that is, is, is the child of an immigrant, and uh, many of us know uh, that the rise in anti-immigrant sentiment uh, we have seen, uh, particularly in the rise of that uh, right across Europe. Uh, and uh, so Patrick Harvey's point is an important one uh, to be made. Uh, in terms of the specifics around whether there should be a statutory aggravator, for example, for uh, anti-immigration, uh, uh, anti-immigrant prejudice, uh, again, uh, there is a section in the consultation that allows a, a kind of open uh, general question around what else needs to be added what else do we have to consider in terms of issues? Uh, I will keep an open mind on the issue that Patrick Harvey uh, raises. I haven't taken a view uh, one way or the other. It has been raised uh, with me previously. I will keep an open mind uh, to that. Uh, as I say, there, there is a section in the consultation that allows for additional uh, points to be raised. Uh, I would encourage him and indeed others uh, who have an interest in this particular uh, question to, 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 to respond to the consultation positively. Thank you. That concludes questions on justice and for the law officers. We will now turn to questions on transport, infrastructure and connectivity. Question number one, Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps are being taken to clear the land near the Shawhead flyover of building materials, materials, barriers and fences from the MA, M73, M74 motorway improvements. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. The area on the south side of the A8 at Shawhead Junction is a compound for storing construction material for the M8, M73, M74 motorway improvement project. At Scottish Roads Partnership, the contractor for the project, has advised that materials are likely to be stored at this location until finishing and snagging works are completed, which is expected to be at the, uh, to be complete, expect to be completed in the coming months. Richard Lyle. Well, I'm interested to know what coming months it is because it, it really is uh, getting a bit of a sore. While I welcome the work being, that was done, there's still a lot of clean up to be done. And can I ask when this site will be cleared and finally restored to its previous state prior to works as it's totally unacceptable? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, the finishing works, as the contractor has stated, will be completed in the coming months over the uh, winter period, and the site will be cleared and it will be restored to its original condition. Fulton McGregor. Thank you, officer, um, the junction at Showhead and Kirk Shaws has seen a number of accidents since the upgrade was completed. Most recently, a very serious accident at the weekend, which police have confirmed resulted in no blame being attached to either driver. Now, the, the police and the local community have continually raised concerns about this junction. I've visited the site with Transport Scotland and had constructive discussions. But the changes that have been made as a result have not improved safety. Will the Cabinet Secretary agree to take up the situation directly with Transport Scotland to get this dangerous junction sorted as quickly as possible? Cabinet Secretary. So an officer, I'm aware Mr McGregor has been pursuing this matter on behalf of his constituents for some time now. Uh, Scottish Roads Partnerships, uh, the contractor for this particular project, uh, undertook further works at the Shawhead uh, Kirkshaw uh, Road Junction at the end of October. 
and I'm disappointed to hear of the concerns that the member still has about this particular junction. We are awaiting further details on the accident to fully get to investigate it fully. Uh, however, I understand that the accident to which the member refers happened on the approach to uh, North Road Junction and not at the Hogsmill uh, Kirkshaw Road Junction. Our contractors are, uh, have confirmed that the junction is operating as designed and that it has no plans to carry out further work at the junction in the short term, although this will continue to be monitored. Having said that, um, SRP it has confirmed that the junction has been completed in accordance with the relevant standards. Transport Scotland is currently organising an independent review to, uh, to be undertaken at the junction to understand if there is further uh, work that can be done. I will ensure uh, that the member uh, has an invitation extended to him uh, to attend the site when this review is taking place. And I'll also write to the member uh, to give him the outcomes of the review once it's been, com been completed. Question number two, Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. And in the interest of transparency, can I advise the Chamber that I am the RMT Parliamentary Group convener and can I ask the Scottish Government when the Transport Secretary last met ScotRail Alliance and what was discussed? Cabinet Secretary. I last met with the Managing Director of the ScotRail Alliance and some of his team on the 6th of November 2018 where we discussed a number of topics, including ScotRail's performance and the impending December 2018 timetable change. Clean Smith. Thank you, President Officer, and I thank the Minister for his response. Did uh, the, the Cabinet Secretary discuss the government's fair work agenda, which doesn't at this moment in time seem very fair to the RMT, whose members are once again being affected by what Mick Cash calls the filthy and disgusting practice of dumping human excrement on Scotland's railways, a practice which the Scottish Government promised had ended in 2017. And will the Cabinet Secretary now tell us what options have been identified for the installation of controlled emission toilets prior to the full refurbishment of the new ScotRail rolling stock and its introduction into service on the 9th um, of December? Or what temporary measures have been identified to mitigate the serious health risks for workers associated with effluent discharge? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, the member raises an important issue, an issue which I know a number of members have uh, concerns about, and rightly so, the RMT on behalf of their members as well. I didn't discuss it at the meeting that I had um, just the other week with uh, uh, the Scott Real Lives because I'd previously discussed the matter with them when they indicated that Wabtec were not going to be able to deliver uh, the new high-speed trains fully refurbished uh, on the timetable that had been agreed. And at that point, I raised concerns about the lack of retention tanks that would be held on the unrefurbished uh, trains. At that point, uh, Scott Rail Alliance uh, agreed to consider to see whether there were interim measures that can be put in place while the trains uh, that are being used have not gone through the full refurbishment uh, programme. They are continuing to look at seeing whether there is an interim arrangement that can be put in place, but I've asked them to look at all possible options to try and minimise the risk um, of, uh, of discharge onto the lines, because I fully understand and recognise that this is an unacceptable practice. It has come about as a result of Wabtec's lack of being able to deliver on the programme, but I am uh, committed to making sure that ScotRail consider every possible option to try and actually identify an interim arrangement that can minimise this potential risk. And uh, as well as the next question on the bulletin, there's three members wish to ask supplementaries on this. The first, Jamie Green. Uh, the, thank you. The Cabinet Secretary may be aware that last week over 100 services were cancelled due to staff shortages. Uh, can the Cabinet Secretary explain why this is the case, if these cancellations are acceptable to him and if passengers can expect any more disruption due to staff shortage? Cabinet Secretary. Well, President Officer, no, the cancellations are not acceptable to me and there's a variety of different reasons as to why there were staff shortages last week. Uh, Scott Rail Alliance are in absolutely no doubt about where the performance is at the present time. It's not acceptable and there's a need for action to be taken to ensure that they see improvements in addressing these issues around service quality and service standards. From the discussions I've had with the Managing Director of the Scott Rail Alliance, they accept that and recognise the need for further progress to be made. Uh, they're very clear in taking forward the recommendations that were set out in the Donovan Review, which they believe will deliver significant improvements uh, to the way in which they deliver services, and that's been independently oversighted through the ORR process. Uh, but I'm very clear that we need to make sure that they are delivering the services that the public expect, uh, and that we will continue to call upon them to do so, and to make sure that they're taking the necessary actions in order to improve service performance overall. Emma Harper. Thank you. 
to ask whether the uh, South Scotland Rail Task Force, led by ScotRail, have ha held any discussions or have any contingency plans in place in order to allow for the continuity of rail services south of Ayr should further work be required at the Station Hotel to ensure that my South Scotland constituents living between Stranraer and Ayr are not isolated or again cut off from the central belt. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, I do recognise the inconvenience it's caused to the members' constituents when there are uh, challenges relating to the uh, uh, air station uh, as a result of the problems with the station hotel uh, and its state of, uh, its state of decay. Um, as the member will be aware, the Transport Scotland set up the uh, air station, the uh, air station task force, in order to uh, look at what action could be taken to restore uh, full rail services south of the south of air. Um, uh, interim services have been put in place in recent weeks. Uh, south Ayrshire Council and their contractors are currently working to develop a system to encapsulate uh, the air station hotel building roof. Uh, this takes account of the commitment which was made by the FM, but that should uh, allow us to get into a position where full services can be restored. That work is ongoing at the present moment, and we expect uh, South Ayrshire Council to continue to make progress with that, and we will continue to offer them support and assistance in helping to try and get that work carried out as quickly as possible. Jackie Bailey. The Cabinet Secretary is clearly aware that performance of rail services are at an all-time low, and indeed less than 50% of services arrived at Balloch and Helensborough on time. Trains have been cancelled, commuters are squeezed in like sardines. Is he aware that passenger numbers are dropping because of that unreliability? When does he expect performance to improve? And why did he weaken performance targets at a time when he should have been on the side of commuters? Cabinet Secretary. Absolutely. Also, in relation to the member's uh, uh, final point there, uh, she's incorrect. Actually, the uh, conditions within the franchise continue to be applied in the way in which they uh, would have uh, been, even with the waiver which has been provided on a temporary basis. Uh, in relation to the points the member makes uh, regarding the performance on uh, the Line 2 Balloch, any time when there are cancellations of services is uh, unacceptable. There can be a variety of reasons as to why that may occur. But the member will recognise that uh, 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 infrastructure challenges have presented uh, ScotRail with a uh, significant difficulty. Um, in excess of, uh, in excess of uh, 60 per cent of the delays and difficulties on the rail network are caused by Network Rail, not by ScotRail themselves, uh, which causes significant challenges for rail operators to address these matters. I know the member may not like to hear the truth, but I'm afraid that is the truth as well. But what I would also say to the member is that what won't be lost on us is a very significant investment we are making into rolling stock in order to make sure we've got additional capacity on routes and we have new and refurbished trains on routes. And that work will continue to be taken forward by this government with the new timetable changes which come into place in December of this month, which will allow us to extend further services into areas where services are not available at the present moment. So performance isn't as good as it should be, but the member can be assured that we are committed to making sure we do everything we can to improve services, notwithstanding the fact that network rail are the biggest, biggest factor that causes problems and delays and cancellations on the network. Michelle ba Sorry, question three, Michelle Ballantyne. Right. To ask the Scottish Government what assurances it will give rail commuters in Tweedbank that services will be reliable this winter, given that last month more than 50% of trains didn't arrive to that station on time, time and scheduled. Uh, officials at Transport Scotland monitor and challenge rail performance through regular meetings, and this has recently included winter preparedness. Significant preparatory work has already commenced, with further actions continuing to manage the challenges of the up-and-coming winter conditions. This includes infrastructure, train fleet stations, depots and staff briefings to ensure the ScotRail Alliance delivers a robust and resilient service to customers. I'd like to point out to the member that performance on Scotland's railways is measured by the public performance measure, the PPM, which is a standard measure for train service performance throughout Great Britain. PPM at Tweed Bank in the last period, which is up to the 10th of November, was 86.4%. Michelle Ballantyne. Well, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. But in September, you reduced the ScotRail's public performance monitoring targets to 87.18%. And in October, you granted the ministerial waiver to Abellio. And given that the Scottish Government will not be enforcing compliant breaches until June next year, what accountability can my constituents actually have in Tweed Bank and to expect that ScotRail's PPM won't fall by another percentage point? 
Right, members, to speak through the chair. Cabinet Secretary. Sign off, I'm sure the member will welcome the fact that the PPM for Tweed Bank is actually above the UK average on these matters, uh, recognising the level of performance there. Having said that, we want to see it to be at a higher level uh, where that can be delivered. And uh, what has been taken forward under the Donovan Review that I've already made reference to is about making sure that we see those types of improvements. The member will also be aware of the very significant financial investment the Scottish Government is making in new rolling stock in order to make sure that we have increased capacity, more seats on trains, and that we also have more modern trains, which allows us to cascade uh, other services to uh, other parts of the country. But the member can be absolutely assured we will continue to do everything we can to drive up improvements within uh, ScotRail Alliance. But alongside that, we also expect Network Rail to step up and to start to address the issues because of the difficulties that they're causing as a result of infrastructure failures that have a dramatic impact on service quality for many customers across Scotland. Question number four, James Kelly. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what impact ScotRail performance is having on pupils who require the use of train services to travel to school. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the ScotRail Alliance is making significant investment to deliver recommendations identified from the Donovan Independent Review which will support infrastructure, fleet and operational reliability across the railway network to ensure the delivery of a resilient network. The Scottish Government has no data which details any particular impact of train cancellations or delays specifically on children travelling to school. However, all rail passengers will benefit from the expected improvements to performance when actions from the Donovan Review, which are currently being progressed, are fully implemented. James Kelly. Uh, thank you. Can I draw the Minister's attention to the fact that uh, I've been approached by parents of uh, children in the Newton area who have had their education disrupted because of constant delays and cancellations at ScotRail. Uh, and those, include, those parents include Virginia Bell, uh, mother of 13-year-old Natasha Humphreys. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that it's totally unacceptable that pupils as, as young as first year age are left on cold and dark ScotRail platforms because of cancellations and delays rather than being in the, the warmth of the school, uh, school classrooms. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, yes, it is unacceptable. All the more reason for ScotRail to address the issues which were identified in the Donovan Review in order to make sure they're addressing the concerns and the problems which are causing some of these delays and these cancellations. And that's why ScotRail have made it very clear through the ScotRail Alliance they are doing everything they can to make sure they drive forward improvements which were set out in the Donovan mm -hmm. Review. Question number five, Maureen Watt. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the opening of the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, my statement to Parliament on the 1st of November detailed the issues ARL were reporting with opening the road, including more extensive technical issues at the Don Crossing than the contractor had previously thought. I met with ARL on the 8th of November to offer any additional support required to get the remainder of the road open as soon as possible and to understand the timescale for remedial work at the Don. I and my officials have been involved in a series of high-level meetings with ARL since then, designed to move, remove any obstacle to the road being opened while remedial work at the dawn progresses. While this dialogue continues to be constructive, I am acutely aware that it cannot go on forever. I continue to be concerned that entirely separate commercial claims that the contractor has indicated it wishes to pursue relating to other aspects of the project appear to be getting linked to this process. I've reminded ARL it stands at the beginning of a 30-year relationship with the North East, and it would be unfortunate for all parties if considerable benefits to the North East are being withheld and the taxpayer generally is being held to ransom in service of a misguided commercial strategy. Maureen Wood. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that a very detailed answer. So can he then tell me if it is at all possible that uh, specific parts of the route that are, are completed and would be safe to open can in fact be opened rather than the complete route including the Don Crossing? Cabinet Secretary. Absent officer, as I said in my uh, statement uh, previously to Parliament, it is possible for the section which is complete, uh, excluding the Don Crossing, for that section to be 
opened. There was no provision within the contract to allow that to happen. However, a contract variation could be put forward in order to achieve that. That's exactly what has been put to the contractors and we are waiting for the contractors to respond to that matter. There is no reason why that cannot be progressed at an early date and we are continuing to get daily updates from the ARL to make sure that they're taking action to progress this. But as I've made it very clear, I'm not prepared to allow us to be put in a position where quite literally uh, contractors are seeking to try and hold taxpayers to ransom over this matter. There is a contract variation that could be agreed to and I expect the contractors to give that due consideration and to make progress with it as soon as possible so that local people can start to get the benefits of this part of the ARL or the, the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route which is ready for use. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Look, one of the reasons given in the statement on the 1st of November for the delays was correcting the defects on the bridge over the River Don. So what has been done since the 1st of November and when does the Cabinet Secretary expect the work to be completed? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I mentioned uh, previously, the reasons for the delay is because of the technical issues which they are, uh, they've identified on the River Don, which at the end of October they identified as being more extensive and more complex than they'd originally anticipated. That work continues on the bridge on the River Don uh, with their own technical experts alongside support which has been provided by Transport Scotland's technical experts to support them in carrying out that remedial work. As I also stated during the course of my statement, that remedial work is weather sensitive and it will uh, have an impact on when some of that work can be completed. However, the contractors are continuing to do everything possible to get that work on the bridge over River Don completed as quickly as possible and they're continuing to expect the work to be completed in December of this year. However, they are unable to specify a date because of uh, the vagaries of things such as the weather, which can have an impact on completing that work. Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. The Cabinet Secretary mentioned the case for a contract variation. I will he confirm that any price attached to a contract variation has to reflect the impact on pricing and programming of that contract variation rather than wider issues. And is that the basis on which he is holding these discussions currently with contractors? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the way, as a member will be aware, is that the, uh, a contract of this nature is that a uh, contractor, the uh, lenders and the contractors are only paid once the road is open for use. And any contract variation must be on that basis because that's a requirement for, uh, for, uh, for taxpayers to protect their interests. Uh, but we've removed any potential obstacle for them actually opening up the section of the road which could be used to traffic today and that variation has been put to the contractors for them to share with their lenders. I can see no further obstacle to not making progress with this matter and that's why I'm very clear about the need for them to make progress with this issue to allow the road to be open to cars and traffic that want to make use of it but the member can also be assured I will continue to apply as much pressure as I can to them to make sure they do that but I'm also concerned about the way in which they wish to wrap it up and a wider issue relating to uh, uh, a claim that they have, which, uh, which is already in the public domain, regarding issues relating to the overall contract. In my view, that is a separate issue, and the contract variation should stand on its own, and the contractors and the lenders should consider it on that basis. Uh, thank you. Apologies to Gillian Martin and to Peter Chapman, who both wanted to ask supplementaries on that issue, uh, and in fact, to the other questions on the bulletin, which we didn't manage to reach. However, that concludes...